My name is Barbara Hogue, and I'm the chapter coordinator for the ICAA chapter um, in Philadelphia. And I welcome all of our members and our friends who are with us tonight. We are excited for tonight's presentation, and I will introduce the vice president of the Philadelphia chapter of the ICAA, Deborah Sloan White, to introduce tonight's guest. So, Deborah, please take it away. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I am Deborah Sloan White, the Vice President of the Philadelphia Chapter of the ICAA, and we are thrilled to welcome you all to tonight's presentation by Marianne Cusado. We've presented virtual talks to the public for two years featuring renowned artisans, architects, and designers, and these online talks have reached more people than has ever been possible in the past. The ICAA Philadelphia is also excited to announce that the Trumbauer Awards will be presented on Thursday, November 3rd here in Philadelphia. We invite you to join us for this award ceremony that honors exemplary work in architecture, design, planning, landscape architecture, decorative and fine arts that preserve and advance the classical tradition. Tickets can be purchased through our website. Our sponsors help us to achieve this success and without their support, none of this would be possible. So we thank graciously all of our sponsors and the following dual level sponsors. Voith McTavish Architects, Hyde Park Moldings, Capaletti Builders, North American Window and Door, Peter Zimmerman Architects, Pinemar, Tradewood Windows and Doors, Duration Moldings and Millwork, Ernst Brothers Builders, John Milner Architects, LePage Millwork, Period Architecture, Rittenhouse Builders, Spire Builders, and Dimitri J. Vervarelli Incorporated. Our speaker this evening is a dear friend and former classmate of mine, Marianne Cusato. Marianne is renowned for her work on innovative housing solutions for disaster recovery and workforce housing. She currently splits her time between academia and practice. Marianne is a professor of the practice and director of housing and community regeneration initiatives at our alma mater, the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture. Additionally, she is the partner in charge of design and development at Cyprus Community Development Corporation a nonprofit housing corporation dedicated to creating resilient and energy efficient homes that are also dignified and attainable. Cyprus CDC built 450 Katrina cottages in Louisiana through FEMA funding and continues their work today in the Florida Keys, Santa Rosa, California, Panama City, Florida, and the island of Barbuda. The author of two books, the Just Right Home, Buying, Renting, Moving, or Just Dreaming, Finding Your Perfect Match with Daniel DeClerico and Get Your House Right, Architectural Elements to Use and Avoid with Ben Pentreth. She has been a contributor to Fortune Magazine and wrote a regular column for Fine Home Building Magazine. We welcome Marianne this evening and look forward to her talk inspired by her book, Get Your House Right, Architectural Elements to Use and Avoid an invaluable resource for architects, builders, and the community at large. I know I have a copy on my desk. And with that, Marianne, we're looking forward to your talk. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, um, Barbara, and everyone at the ICA for having me here today. And thanks everyone for coming out or virtually coming um, to the talk. I am I love these talks. I love the fact that I can parachute in. This talk is based on um, based on the ideas of the book, Get Your House Right, but goes on a little bit deeper than that. Um, we'll start with just the big picture of what is, you know, essentially what is design, what is architecture? Um, very often when you think about architecture, you think about the physical building. Um, we're the Institute for Classical Arch and Ar Art and Architecture. So that would then, you the thought bubble that might come up is, <clears throat> we're going to talk about classical buildings. And while we definitely do talk about buildings, and this talk will be very, um, go into actually quite some depth on architectural elements, before we get into the details, before we get into this end of the spectrum, down with the how the pieces put, fit together, it's important to consider that everything happens on a spectrum, that the choices that we make about materials, the choices that we make about the building itself influences what the street 
feels like? Is it an outdoor room? And the streets go together um, to create public realms that define cities and cities network together. And we're looking at the whole planet. Uh, and you can't really look at one without the other. I mean, even down to elements of the supply chain. Um, a deep freeze in Texas means I can't get a window in Florida. Um, and it goes beyond that globally. So all of the decisions we make, both in terms of design and specification, are tied to the spectrum um, where everything is is related. Um, I'll talk. This talk is focused really more on the 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 house and the detail angle. But I always want to start with the big picture because it's important to consider the city and the streets as as we're looking at those individual buildings. The the talk is also based on the premise that there's two basic roles of a building, um, any building, whether, and this is showing back to some of the original structures of classical um, antiquity, and essentially the two the two main roles of any building before, we de before you look at use or anything else is to stand up and keep water out. Um, we used to have to do this through the design of the building. Now we can engineer, literally engineer buildings that look upside, that are sort of designed to be flipped upside down. So the idea of shedding water off of, um, through a gutter or with a drip, you know, edge, those things are less, less critical. Um, but when we ignore them, when we don't look back to how we shed water off of a building or how the building stood up before we had steel that could let us um, let us do whatever we wanted. Um, when we forget how the structures used to have to perform, we lose something in the process. Um, and that's where um, this talk is based on going back to that and back to the original principles of essentially, how does a building stand up? How does a building keep water out? Um, and what influence does that have on the design? Because now when you can do anything, we wanna create buildings that feel authentic. Um, and the, the authenticity is, is such a tricky thing. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why we wrote Get Your House Right was because it was the book that I needed when I graduated from school. We studied classical architecture. We, I could, I could give you the proportions from Vitruvius and Palladio. Um, but when it came to applying those stone proportions to how, how that would work in a, in a smaller home that is built of wood, um, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to convert that. And at the same time, I was looking at new buildings that were being built and I couldn't quite figure out why they didn't look right. I didn't know enough to be able to identify it. And so Get Your House Right started as a series of details and examples. I would see one detail in a book and I'd, I'd copy it and I'd, you know, I'd have, started this little collection of all of the images of how to do, to catalog, how you actually design in detail a traditional home. At the same time, um, I was on a charrette with um, Andreas Duani and it was, it was, I'm dating myself here, but it was in the olden days when we weren't emailing, we were faxing. And Leon Creer sent Andreas a fax that said, wouldn't it be funny if we created a catalog of all of the places where things go wrong? And so Leon, um, so Andreas handed that to myself and, and another colleague and said, you know, draw these as quickly as you can, we're gonna send it back. And that started the second half of the book, which created this, this idea of the avoid and use, to train your eye to see the difference. Because as we got into it, we realized when we moved on past the, this is funny to draw things that aren't quite right, we realized there were patterns to it. And it all comes down to a basic sort of understanding of a language. Um, we, like any language, architecture has a language. Um, and within that, there's a vocabulary and the grammar. We all know the vocabulary of, of, the, of any architecture, and that's the windows, the doors, the eaves, all of the elements that come together to form the building. But we've lost over time when we, when we no longer had to have the building stand up on its own structure, and when we no longer had to keep water out through the design because we have wonderful flashing and don't get me wrong, I love flashing. Um, but because we have those things, we forgot the grammar. And so this book seeks to seeks to retrain that language so you can recognize the difference. And this, this talk is based on that premise. Um, the other element that came up, um, if you've all, uh, we've all probably at some point in your life played the telephone game where you sit around and you whisper something um, around the room and it comes back as a completely different um, statement. 
architecture and design is very much like that. You have the initial um, concept that's in the head of the architect or the designer, um, or even the step before that, the, the thought bubble of the owner, the client who says, I want this. And that translates, it, it changes as it goes from to the head of the designer as they're looking at it to the hand or the keyboard where the image is created. Then that goes to somebody to price it. Um, that The person that's pricing it is somebody that's different than building it and ordering the pieces for it, all the bits and pieces. And then you have somebody that's actually assembling it on site. And at each of these points, things can go wrong, things can change. And what comes out the other end may or may not be what was actually originally designed. This from the designer's point of view is often very frustrating. And I fell in the trap very early on of, of always blaming everybody downstream because clearly I was the genius. Um, not, not, not really, but obviously I was, that's, it's the young designers um, fallacy of, of thinking that if we put it on the paper, somebody clearly should be able to understand it. Um, what I realized in this process was my drawing was nothing more than artwork unless I created something that someone could actually build. And very early on in my career, I did a lot of artwork and I'm a little bit ashamed to show you. I'm actually gonna show you some of that today um, of where things went wrong. So hopefully you can, you can see in your own work um, where, you might, where you might make corrections. Um, so I'm gonna start with big picture. We're gonna go through um, some composition. Then I will look at some details of, of how, to, how to put things together and then end with some case studies. Um, <clears throat> Essentially, the biggest um, thing to consider when you're designing a building, we're going to talk about roof plans in a moment, but I'm going to start, start with it and then reinforce it later. Um, everything comes down to the volume of the building. And I design my buildings from the roof plan down. Very often, um, the, as, you're, as a designer, the instinct is to design from the floor plan up, which makes complete sense because you're going to have some sort of a program, whether it's for a small house like I design or a townhouse to a large estate, um, a hospital, a church, a school, any building type, we come with a program. And the natural instinct is to say, well, how big does it need to be? And how does it fit on the site? And you start drawing there. If you, if you start with that and bring it up, sometimes it's gonna work, but not always. Um, I always start with the roof plan down because the roof plan will, will be the massing and creating the massing as the primary, secondary, and tertiary. So you have your the, the volume of the building and then the elements that come into it. And if you consider the composition as that first step is laying out the massing, a lot of other elements fall into place as you go. And the second big principle to consider, you've got your massing now, um, is to consider how the openings on the, the massing layout. Um, this will determine where the focus of your eye goes. Uh, and you can use these tools, I, the unity and duality, you can use this with your openings to really direct somebody. And when you look at any building, um, when you start to understand this language and the grammar, uh, you can read a building in a, in a second at a glance um, I know that my eye will land on the, the two here, my eye lands in the center. So your eye will naturally stop at a void um, if it's in the center. So this is called, this is unity, which is means that there's a, a single center um, here as well. It's a center void. Um, a duality is even at a glance, it'd be pretty obvious. I mean, there's not a door there, but even if there are two doors, it would be your eye doesn't know where to land. And so you can use these for the sides of buildings where you want to inflect the view back up. This temple front shows um, a unity on the front, reinforced by the, the pediment, which is this triangle shaped element right here. Um, a duality on the side because the center solid. This is something that you can use, especially as you have your volumes and your additive massing and you want to inflect the eye, and you want to pull a focus um, to other element areas of the building. The third major principle to consider as you're laying out any composition is the division of a line. We're going to look at these um, in a case study in a moment. But essentially, there are three ways to divide a line. You could either divide it in half, straight down the middle. You can differentiate it which is, um, this is the ratio of a golden section, but it's not quite at the, in the center and it's not quite at the end, or you can punctuate it. 
um, nature's proportions sort of fall under all of these. You can really, you can actually analyze, this isn't a proportioning talk, but you can analyze just about any anything down from sort of your hand, and your hand has a punctuation in the nail, it has, you know, all of the, all of nature's proportions can be divided in these three ways. The important thing about this to understand is equality equals the duality. So this element here, this is equality, which is a great tool in certain areas if you want to mute something, if you want to make pull a, des pull a design down so it calms it down. Um, but very often we use equality in a way that doesn't reinforce a hierarchy. So I'm going to, and these are, this sounds a little bit sort of big picture, but I promise you we're in, a, this point will land in a few moments. I'm introducing the principle and we'll, we'll look at it in place. Um, and so we, you just need to be aware of, if you know the vocabulary and the, and the ways that you can um, divide a composition up, you can, th you then have the toolkit to utilize. Your lines as you put them down um, have meaning. This is an example here of a very common one where we have a first floor and a second floor, and there's a some sort of a band going through the building. It's creating an equality, which means that the eye doesn't know which is more important. And within a building, we always want hierarchies. Um, this is showing it that as differentiated, where you're pushing the the emphasis up, which means very clearly tells the story that this is the more important. Um, floor. Now you could carry a band here and say that link these up. There's once you get into more sophisticated um, layers of design, um, then there's all sorts of ways that you can play with this and do amazing things. Uh, but when I look at designs, when I see, um, especially like student work, um, there's a lot of equalities. And so this is an area where you will see a common thread, a common theme um, of, a, of design elements that work against the hierarchy of the building. The next big picture element to consider is, um, is understanding the difference between size and scale. <clears throat> These two images were taken in New Orleans, just actually just a, about a block apart. Um, I love them because they, they just, they tell the story so clearly. Um, if you were to look at the, a spec and on these, on these buildings, um, just a tear sheet, um, on paper, the one on the left would, would be a, larger house it would it's a wider house they're about the same depth it would feel like a more generous home um but the scale of it is is changed for two reasons one it's pushed back so it almost looks like an outbuilding to this even instead of a neighbor so it's pushed back away from the street and it has very diminutive details ironically this house which is held up to the street and probably has a 14 foot ceiling um, it scale wise reads as a much larger house. Um, <clears throat> it even, and this, I couldn't have placed it better, dwarfs a Hummer. And if, you, if you've ever been by one of those, you realize how big the scale of this, this vehicle is. This, this house that's narrow, narrower in width to the length of the vehicle is dwarfing the vehicle. And so it's really important to consider the difference between size and scale and use that in, in your designing and as you're creating place and space to, as a tool to help you, um, to help you make the, the homes live larger and in some cases um, reduce up the feeling of it. Um, so that's the, we've set the, set the, the big pixel, picture principles. Um, now we're gonna shift to um, some of the details. Now, Oh, I'd mentioned it before, I'm repeating it because it's such a critical um, point is designed from the roof plan down. Um, it's so easy to get pulled into a floor plan that meets all of the program needs, you've worked everything out, um, and then there's just no way to put a lid on it. There's no way to get the massing and the feeling of it right because this thing just, just morphed up. Um, and it's not about the amount of floor space it takes up. It's all about the volume that comes up and how the pieces come together. Um, when I was writing Get Your House Right, I went, it was the time when the grocery store still had all of those sort of deluxe and luxury books and I was uh, for house plans. So I got one of those and I traced the little floor plan and decided that I was gonna draw the roof plan for these, these compare and contrast images. Understanding of course that the scale of this is, is a much larger 
footprint of elements. Um, probably if I were doing this drawing again, I might might actually break this one apart a little bit more. Um, but I was trying to create something that showed the simplicity of form versus the complexity of form. Um, and I spent a good hour trying to figure out how you would connect the dots to, to put this building together. And of course, there's gonna be height differences that have things crashing in. Um, anytime you do that, anytime you create that complexity, it's just, it's an absolute nightmare for the, the people that have to build it. It creates all sorts of opportunities for leaks and you're putting budget and money up into a roof um, where you can't touch or feel it. It's money that is just, it's really sunk, sunk costs. Um, so again, just, just really think of the building from the volume and the roof plan down, and a lot of things are going to fall into place. Um, that's especially important. If you look at this one, this is a larger house. You can tell. I mean, it's got the the a little bit of a McMansion-y feel, but you can tell this is a pretty big home. Um, and I want to continually throughout this talk shift between scales of buildings because these principles are universal. They they go for all across the board. These are principles that can be applied whether you're designing the 300 square foot Katrina cottage or you know a 30,000 square foot house and everywhere in between. It's all of the same toolkit. It's just utilized with different um, and in a different scale essentially. Um, one of the things we found as we were getting into the 90s with these drive till you qualify large houses that kept growing and growing up until the 2005 peak and then 2008 cr market crash was houses, as houses grew, they got dumber because you had so much space that you really didn't have to resolve things very well. When they started to come back in, there was a real there was a real loss of an understanding of how you actually made things work. The one uh, so the house that's drawn here on the avoid side, um, this is actually a house that was designed. I do a lot of design doctor work, and this was one of the uh, developer brought me in and said, "I know that something is wrong with this house." He was building a neighborhood um, and wanted to bring the houses closer to the street. He wanted it to be traditional, uh, and he'd hired somebody to do it. They had done this work. And he said, I, I know something is wrong with this, but I don't know how to put my finger on it. And what was wrong with it was that it was designed from the floor plan up, that they took a very complex um, volume and just tried, they crashed the roofs um, until they, they had all of these bits and pieces. Um, they, this is a duality. So all of the things that we've just talked about, you don't know because you have the, the porch, the double porch here, which is a duality in itself, you have the equal sort of balancing between the bay and the dormers. Um, we'll talk about window placement in a moment, but there's a little bit of a cross-eyed nature of this. And so there's so much going on and packed into this building because as they grew up, when they came back down, it was very common to try and keep the same number of elements in. And part of this is is being a little bit allergic to simplicity. The idea that through simple proportions, you can actually create a really beautiful building has is the opposite very often of these like, mansions that we have where everything grew. So as everything comes back down and as that we try and build buildings that work together to be, create community, we, we can't shake a couple of these sticky design ideas of the complexity that's been brought in. So as the building comes in, it's really about designing from the roof plan down, simplifying the volumes and creating a few elements, putting the budget into a few elements that you could execute really well and then letting all the other stuff go. You don't need a bay, dormers and a pediment on a double porch. You can have beautifully proportioned windows with some nice shutters and a portico. You can have through the, the simplicity of your elements, you can actually add a little bit of, of cost back into each of them because there's fewer of them overall. We're gonna transition now into windows and openings. Essentially, once you've set the volume of your building, once that roof plan and the volumes have come together, the next thing you're doing is looking at how we how you um, put punch openings into the volume. Now this, as when you're on the other end of things where things are going up and down and in and out, it can get quite complex. I always start with really simple volumes and then add to it. It's not to say every building should just be a box because clearly that the world would be pretty redundant and boring if it was. But when you start, instead of starting on the complex side, if you start on the simple side and add to it, 
the the volumes that you get will naturally feel a little bit better. Um, so one of the the elements here is the first question is how much opening should you have? Um, and now of course this is going to be very this is going to relate to climate a little bit more. There's some certain climates where you want larger windows, other climates, northern and cold and cl colder climates where you would want some smaller openings. Um, but in general, if you look across the board, 15 to 35 percent opening, sort of the the opening to wall ratio is usually um, about where a, a well-balanced building falls. It's, I mean, it's a pretty wide range as well. Um, very often you can have, most likely you're gonna have less openings on, on the front of the building, more on the back where you might more naturally flow out into a garden. Um, and so even within a house, depending on whether you have a sunroom, that's gonna be a much larger proportion of opening. Um, it, overall though, it should balance out. Um, once you've set, you, once you've proportioned your openings, you want to consider how they how they sit. This is the the window, the one that I just um, noted. There was a little bit of a cross-eyed nature of those windows. Um, now, if you have other elements, if you're layering on architectural elements to this, then of course this changes this rule of thumb um, and adjusts it. But essentially, you want the overall composition to be balanced in the openings. Now, if you're in, there's an exception to every rule. Um, and I, I want to point that out too, is the rules of thumb that I'm showing here, this is a point of departure. This essentially is, is getting you up to a really respectable level. Um, the best designs break all of these rules. And so there's no, there's nothing, in fact, you could actually have a, an amazing time designing a house that broke all of these rules and make it completely gorgeous. If you walk through, you know, if you walk through historic Charleston, if you walk through, you know, beautiful areas of Philadelphia, you're going to see um, everything that's the opposite of what I'm telling you. There's going to be a beautiful example of it. Um, but what this does in any code or any set of rules of thumb will essentially eliminate the worst of the worst. If you take it too literally, it is also going to eliminate the best of the best. So all of this advice is offered with a lens of use this as a point of departure, train your eye to notice and see and be able to read the building. And then from there, make a judgment about what you want to use and how you want to bend it. It's without knowing the grammar, it's without understanding that these rules of thumb exist that designs get in trouble. Because when you understand it, then if you if you move your windows closer together, you might say, I'm, you know, I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna add some pilasters or add another element in. Um, and that works perfectly well. Um, so in this case, if you're in Venice, that's how you design it because that's 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 what it looks like. You push the windows closer to the, the corners. Um, but on their own, if you have the cross-eyed or the, the wall-eyed options, it doesn't feel quite right. Um, the, a rule of thumb is to dot shutters in, even if you're not using them, to be able to, um, to, to create the, the, um, the right proportions. Um, the other thing you want to do is consider that all of the openings, not just the window size, but the light, the actual window pane, the transom, any glazing that you have in the doors, all of that wants to be part of the same system. And if you've really sort of worked on the proportions, you could actually, the overall volume of the building as well can be linked into that. Um, very often we see just sort of a one of each, everything from the window catalog, and that makes it very hard to knit an overall composition together. It's it's common to have like lots of little tiny lights in the lower um, lower window. And when I say light, it's like the pane of glass. That's the architectural term for the pane of glass. Um, you'll have a transom over a door. That's the little window over the door that doesn't relate at all to anything. Um, and then these bigger openings, your eye is naturally drawn to the largest piece of glass. Uh, historically, glass was, they could, and, and if you look at older buildings, there's no issue, there wasn't an issue making large panes of glass historically, but there was an issue with transporting it. So it was a sign of great wealth to have a larger pane of glass rather than a smaller because it would very often break and there was more effort put into the transportation, making it more expensive. So it was a sign of wealth to be able to have the larger panes of glass. 
Um, but what it also does is even at a glance, if you give this what I would call the squint test, if you squint at this, your eye actually goes up here, which you could argue might be the, the least important window in this, this probably a bathroom or a little stair opening. Um, when this is the hierarchy that you want to point your eye to, it's this ground floor where you'd have your living room, your dining room. So whatever, all of the elements that you put into the building, you want to use to reinforce what the hierarchy is and where the more important elements, the public rooms are. And so when you have little lights, it actually inflects your eye away. Um, I've mentioned before the golden section when we were looking at the differentiation of a line. This um, this is the a very sort of and completely different talk to go into proportions, but essentially the nature's proportions very often align with this, where you take a square, you take the the midway point, and use that as a um, as the radius to give you this rectangle. Um, I use this when proportioning windows and when proportioning the overall building. Um, I use it with a grain of salt because then you also have to order the product. And this, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. Um, if as a designer or an architect, you're drawing something that looks absolutely beautiful on paper, if the materials aren't there to actually build it, you're an artist. And so the real trick is saying, how do I... Unless you, of course, you're working in ultra high end where literally everything is custom, then more power to you, be an artist and a craftsman will make it. Um, but that's not every project and great places and cities, even high end projects that where you're having to order parts, um, some parts stock, you'll need to think about this. Um, you'll need to think about how you take the principles and then purchase. Um, so here, there's the first three, and I'm going to show you in a second, uh, bad, betters, and then bests in terms of how you would decide between the first floor and the second floor, um, how to select your windows. Um, bad, which we just discussed, is to have a bunch of little lights below with the larger lights above. Hierarchically, that is actually a more important window, even though there's more little divisions here. You see this quite often where you sort of try to cram more in less space. It, it actually does the exact opposite than it might, um, um, than, than you might think it does. This one is these two. So these are both betters. And I actually use this one quite a bit on a couple of different projects um, for the sake of economy. Um, but essentially they're a little bit static. And if you're using either of these options, you have to do something in your design to sort of accommodate that. Um, so the first one is the exact same window light size. It's just on the top, there's a hierarchy because there's six over six and then the bottom is nine over nine. So what you're trying to do when you're designing your windows is to create a system where everything on the building is connected together yet it's also differentiated. And that does that, but the jump in the differentiation can be a little more extreme. So you have to have other elements to counterbalance. Um, this has them both the same. And for the sake of economy, sometimes I do this, but what it can do is create a duality. So you have to find other ways to differentiate between the first and the second floor. Then you have, um, this is common in Williamsburg where you would take the exact same window and then just reduce it a little bit. Um, it definitely doesn't work in a masonry building. It can look a little bit diminutive on the second floor. That's why it's a better, not a best. Um, the two that are the best would be to do the six over six over six over nine. So it's the exact same upper sash in both. The bottom sash just has one extra row and that allows the hierarchy between the two, but there's also a differentiation. Um, and then another one, which would take, this one actually shows the golden section is the opening here. This is a two, two to one ratio. This is a golden section. And actually it ends up that the light size here matches the opening there. So your, your width is the same and it just comes down a little bit. Um, this is an example where you have with a one of each. This was actually the back of that same project that I'd shown a little bit before of, you know, just a little bit of everything. And especially this, just don't do transoms on windows. Like unless you're really high end and getting crap, getting getting it um, custom made, it's a there's a high hit miss ratio. Um, try try to avoid the horizontal lights overall. Um, and in fact, quite honestly, at this point, I don't even put window lights in. I just do one over ones. It's you can you can't buy them um, um, a decent one. So it's I I actually on all of this, I would just simplify if possible and just go one over one and call it done. Um, 
and same with these, you know, this is if you're grouping or ganging, I'm showing these where they're, the sides feel like they've been sort of pressed in. Um, if you are doing lights, match them here. But again, sometimes it's easier, less, do less and go with, go without. Um, here are the rules of thumb. This is where I start with either a 3-0 or a 2-8 window um, by 6-0 for the first floor and 5-6 for the, the second floor. Um, and then whatever the closest window size in the catalog is, because we have to have the realities of, of ordering our products and, and building in flexibility. Um, and this is at the higher end. This was a project I did that had, uh, it was another design doctor, but instead of at a production builder level, it was at a very high end level where the, the person that had designed the house had basically one of every window. And so the system that we created was we chose this A window was a stock window. And that was what most of the house was. But we ended up going and just taking that light size. And then all of every other window was, was some form of that. And so it was just, you add a row, you add a row here. And that, that created the unity while there was hierarchy um, throughout. And so this is the, the elevation showing. And even we tried to get this fairly close. It wasn't completely close, but, um, but each of the window lights here relates to each other, even though as the, the, they progress through the building, they're different. And that allowed um, with a very complex volume and there's a lot of complexity in the building, it was one thing that unified um, unified it as it went together. And here you are again with all of these relating to the same and even the doors, all part of one system, the, the four lights here versus all of this. So each one is set with that same system, which allowed the, um, the building to, to be tied together, even though there was so much going on. Now, a quick note on eaves. We have, um, these are four types. We have, there's others when you get into the the weeds of it, but some basically four sort of main types, whether there's the poor man's cornice, which is a more classical eave. Um, that's where you have the, the moldings are wrapping around and the ones that are on the raking side, which is the angled side of the gable, actually come down and resolve into the, the horizontal moldings. Um, this is a great way of not having to get really expensive um, what's called a split fillet where the, the molding wraps and goes up. Um, I would recommend this as a very simple, um, a simple solution that's very elegant. Um, the next step down from that is still a, is a box eave, but I'm showing a half round gutter here. I know that there's a lot of pushback to those. So if you end up having to have the OG or the K style gutter, I kind of rail against those in the book, but I've also sort of hit reality enough to know that you know, you can't win everything. And sometimes, um, sometimes you just have to surrender to, to, to the realities of things. So I have started, I've softened on the idea of a half round gutter, because again, if I, if I force the point and then somebody puts an OG gutter on a building that wasn't meant to be on it, it's going to look worse than if I find a way of making it work. And so as I've grown into my career, I'm finding ways to understand when I need to hold a line on something and when I need to surrender. And I will admit on the half round gutter, I've kind of surrendered. Um, but this is a, a flat soffit all the way around. There's no moldings here, which simplifies things and a very low slope on the roof. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Then you've got the angled eave, um, which I use almost exclusively at this point. Um, open eaves where I use sometimes, but you have to, it ends up being a little more expensive um, for long-term care. Um, so within these types, a couple things to look for. This is your your poor man's cornice, also a, a version of the box B, a boxed eave. Um, watch out here for to for this little bit, um, the little eave return. You do not want it to match the slope of the roof. It doesn't need to. If you think about the slope of the roof is shedding water off of the roof itself. This is just shedding water off of this little you know, sometimes 12 inch area. So just tuck it down, have it below. And this works for either the poor man's cornice or the box eave where you just want to simplify things, ease off a little bit. Um, the sort of public enemy number one when it comes to eaves is the pork chop. Um, the pork chop is, is um, a necessity of, in some cases of the, just of a budget. 
Um, there's two ways to avoid it. One, I do, I always specify an angle leave. It takes a little bit more effort. So depending on where you are on the, on the, um, the, the price spectrum is a, you may have, have to make a call. Um, and essentially the reason why the pork chop happens is that you're, you have a horizontal leave coming this way. You have the roof that's angled down and this essentially just connects the dots. If an angled eave is not in the budget, that if that's just a too complex of a detail to do, sometimes it's actually completely fine to do, but the default setting isn't that, so it just ends up being horizontal. Um, then, and this is an example of one um, where, and this might be a little bit too, too um, ornate for many, but you could just do some sort of a bracket. So the front part of the gable is angled, and at this point, you put some sort of a bracket to cover up the fact that there's a little triangle there. And that that can goes a long way towards, towards making the building read even better. It gives you a much nicer shadow line. Um, so now let's look at a couple case studies. This is, um, this is a house that I designed. This is a digital a rendering of it, the new economy home. Um, and this is when I was still in the sort of the, the wide-eyed sort of artist phase of my life. Um, I love how this feels proportion wise. There's three foot windows with shutters that are designed to match the window. We haven't talked about shutters yet, but essentially on shutters, um, avoid the little 12 inch ones, avoid the shutter that, that can't cover the window. It doesn't have to be operable, but it does have to look like it could be. Um, you know, the rule of thumb for any design element is it doesn't have to work. It just has to look like it could. Um, so when you walk down the street and you look at a new building and you say, it doesn't feel right. I, you know, I can't sing in tune, but I can tell you if someone's singing out of tune. The 12 inch shutter is one of the elements that it, that very quickly um, becomes out of tune with the, the proportions of a building. Um, but I was still in, let's draw shutters. Um, and somebody um, built, purchased the plans for this house. They built it. It was a really good builder and they did an amazing job, but they took the drawing that I did and they made a couple changes. Um, they made a couple changes to the porch and they made a couple changes, which were completely rational changes. Um, it was an economy home. We designed it in 2008. Um, but what happened was that they had uh, in their community up in Warwick Grove, they had a rule that said that you couldn't have window shutters unless they were operable. And so they took the shutters off because operable shutters are really expensive. It makes complete sense. It's a really rational thing to do. They also, instead of a 3.0 window, made it um, a 2.8 window, which meant that the window to wall ratio, the opening ratio on this house didn't end up. That's, it's just not the same house. Um, and I loved what they did for so many reasons. But it, it, it upset me when I saw this because as much as I loved it, I realized that I had designed a building that was impossible to build. And so I took me sort of a, a little bit of a sort of a moment to say, okay, well, how do I fix this? So I did a couple of things. One, if somebody builds it with, um, and this actually I think is in Warwick as well, they actually took one where they put the shutters and it worked perfectly well. Um, and then I redesigned it. So there were four windows and it doesn't matter if they end up, I still specify them at 3.0, but it doesn't matter if they put them in at 2.8. And that's what, and also at this point, I have officially stopped drawing shutters in buildings. Um, if you see a building that I designed that sh shows shutters on it, it means it was designed before 2008. I do not draw shutters on buildings unless it's a custom home and there's, a, which I do very few of, um, and there's a discussion of how we're gonna get the shutter because I realize that I'm designing in something that could never be built. And then, you know, there should be no surprise when somebody doesn't build it the way I want. Um, and this allowed me to, this is all the same home, um, allowed me to create a, a design that couldn't, couldn't go wrong because I embedded in success. And that was something that took me a little while to get to was that, um, that there are ways to embed in success. This I also wanna note does have the same windows on the first floor and the second floor. Uh, I wanted to make it as easy as possible. There are only two windows designed into this home. There's the, the regular window here and then the special. 
Um, I wanted the window order to be as absolutely simple as possible. I wanted the framer to only have to frame two rough openings. And as I notice here, I'm sort of now there's this was a custom version of this house. The stock plan only has the two windows. This is a custom version. So um, take everything, of course, with a grain of salt. Um, but this was this was one that we adapted for a developer. Um, but within the, the base plan, there's only two windows. And that allows simplicity. But I also wanted to make sure there was still hierarchy. So you'll notice the porch. Make sure that you know that this is hierarchically more important. I've ganged the windows here. So there's ways in which knowing that I'm creating something that might be a little static with the same windows up and down, I have designed in and compensated to make that um, adjustment. And here is um, another case of, and this is this was interesting, where we I had to, they they didn't have room for a porch on this same house. And so this was the same house where we actually, I was using the the porch to also absorb the fact that there were some unity and duality shifts going on. Um, and this was my attempt to sort of play with that. And even though there were four windows up, up top, um, when there were four windows up top and they were all spread out, the spacing didn't work. So I linked these up. So even though there's four and there's a solid here, I've linked these two windows together. So it operates as a void. So all of these elements, uh, you know, you can have the most basic layout. And then as it keeps growing, you can start to, you really can start to play around with the proportions. Um, now, this is a case study showing that initial house that we had, I'd looked at that, um, and this is a version of that same one that I'd shown in the book, and they had several designed, where the client had said, you know, can you reskin this? And I actually, in that case, the volume was off. And I said, no, you have to start over. Um, and they actually ended up doing that. But I'm showing this, this is something where everything's a little bit off. And I'm going to go through it one at a time and show why. Um, part of it is that this roof line has got extra, there's there's two, there's this long, it's going to be very thin on the side. Um, and so the first thing I just did was sort out the roof line. So it was, instead of having all of the ins and outs, it was just the, the simple volume. Um, and even that, with nothing else down here, just simply changing the volume, and the footprint is almost identical, um, but just changing the volume of it changes the look. Nothing else changed. The only thing that changed was the volume of the roof. The second thing I did was I addressed the dualities. Um, they had this band here, which was a little bit gratuitous and kind of there for no reason, so shifted the band up. Um, now we're setting a hierarchy. This ground floor is, is, um, is clearly more important. Um, the next element was these windows got a little cross-eyed. So I've shifted the windows out. Um, I've kept the shutters on. Um, the next element was this duality between the top and the bottom. Um, I just shifted it out, made these windows slightly larger. Sometimes it's just a matter too of saying, you know, it's, it's better to like a gained window, um, you know, get, get a little bit more light through each of the windows pulling it out, um, separating it, simplifying. Each of these steps simplifies things. Um, the next thing, there was a lot going on with a lot of like little windows here. I've simplified it into one. Um, and now you have side by side the two buildings, which essentially are um, the exact same house, but one of them just calms everything down. Um, I haven't even touched this. We could go into all sorts of details on the, the detailing of that porch. Um, I like shutters, avoid dormers with every fiber of my being and only put a dormer in a building um, if I will actually be in working on a custom design, which again is very rare um, for me at the moment. Does the hit miss ratio on a dormer is very, very difficult to get to go in your favor. Um, so if you can avoid dormers, avoid shutters. This is a design, this is actually, this building is the result, it's a little hazy, is the result of that redesigned building. Um, and this one, I'm actually here gonna really call myself out on something too. I was working with a developer here and we wanted different Eve profiles so the buildings wouldn't feel too static. Um, and if I had to do this over again, I would actually not have done that because there was too much going on. This is the nicest one because it's a simple angled Eve. This just feels too, um, feels too mashed against the building. There's not enough of a shadow line. This one's okay. Um, this hip roof didn't work at all, plus the material changed. So I definitely, if I had this one to do over again, I wouldn't try so hard to differentiate 
within the details, I would actually choose the really nice, we had three elevations for each building. I would actually calm it down another step. I'd already calmed it down from, from the previous version. I mean, I'd calmed it down from all of these elements to, to look like this. Um, I'd calm it down a step further. I think it was still being a little self-conscious and it's very hard when you're designing something not to be self-conscious, to take yourself out of it. But the, the simpler things you could do um, are better. Um, I'm gonna finish up with one little, one little note about zoning. I've talked about the buildings. Um, we're getting into now very often the complexities of urban design as general citizens, as exclusionary zoning is, is really on the forefront of a lot of communities trying to decide if they're going to allow duplexes and accessory dwelling units and multifamily in. Um, and it's a loaded conversation, which goes back to and can be traced back. One of the courses I teach at Notre Dame is on... Um, on housing and social justice. And it, it, this is a topic that goes all the way back, you know, 100, 100 years to um, segregationist tools. Um, but it's also a design element um, that a duplex, and this is why, this is why the, this conversation of the get your house right, the value of design is so critical because when we're at a basic level with, you know, when we go to the lowest common denominator with design, when we are only, when we're not shepherding an outdoor room and a built environment with a public realm, um, yeah, you get horrible things. And I also would not want to live near a duplex, um, but here are six images. Um, and if we were all in the same room together, I'd ask you to, we'd stop and have a little bit of a feedback on which of these are duplexes. I think at a glance, it's pretty obvious that this is a duplex. Um, and then I'd ask you which of the others are, and really it takes a moment. And if, if you study it, you'll find that there's actually um, duplexes on five of these um, that you would drive by. This one is obvious, but you drive by it before you realize it. So the importance of design, the importance of proportioning, the importance of place in how we create these elements. And if you look at these buildings, they're all the examples of everything that we've just talked about. Designing from the roof plan down, hierarchy between windows, um, a, you know, creating um, simple forms, focusing the the budget into elements you can touch and feel. And all of that is done through the importance of design. Um, and so much of this conversation of, of whether we should abolish, you know, or just say allow um, multifamily in dedicated areas um, comes down to how it's designed. And so the design piece of it um, is such an important element. This is actually not just a duplex, there's three units in here. Um, and this was built next to this. These are all in South Bend. Um, this is, this is, these are across the street from each other. Ironically, it's really the best case study street I've ever found on this. Um, down the street from a historic mansion, these, these were built not exactly at the same time, but it's semi-contemporary that it wouldn't even, that there was no, you wouldn't blink to think that you could have a mansion next to a beautiful duplex. Now, of course, you would never combine it because the design has gotten off. And so of course, if you're a hammer, you think everything's a nail. And so from the design point of view, I think we can save the world with architecture by creating place and by, by designing thoughtful buildings that, that adhere to all the principles we've discussed between the scale and the hierarchy and how we differentiate um, and how we create place in outdoor rooms. Um, and the final image I'll show is the importance of understanding too, that there's variables between the condition of the building, um, whether it's disinvested, um, or invested in that you can have bad design and good design and that the conditions can be good or bad. The worst case scenario, of course, is bad design and bad conditions. Um, but equally bad is good design in or bad design and good conditions. Ideally, we'd be looking for sort of good design and good conditions. Um, but that's up to all of us in both understanding how to design it at everybody at every point in that telephone game. Um, and everyone, even just as citizens, what we allow in our communities. And, um, and it's, a, it's, I mean, it's really one of the, the issues of our time. Um, so thank you for, for attending today and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Hi everyone, it's Barbara again. You can add your questions in the Q and A or the chat function and I will um, call them out for Marianne to answer. Um, Here's one that's more of a um, comment, which says uh, shutter sizing is definitely an issue in Philadelphia row house architecture. 
I've noticed yeah. that a lot of buildings from the 1700s to the 1800s don't feel right when it comes to opening. Oftentimes, when this is the case, they still have neglected hinges on the window corners where shutters used to be. Yeah, and, you know, this is, and sh you know, this is when you when you add in a historic context that has then been renovated, you do you get all sorts of issues on top of it. I mean, it's bad enough in a new condition, new setting. I mean, I haven't even um, gone down the road of what you do to honor a historic building and create something that you know you you know very often you're going to have to replace something. It's just that the original material over time needs to be maintained and often replaced. And doing that sympathetically within the constraints of materials that are available, unless everything is custom, can be very difficult. And yet it comes down to that, trying to be as authentic to, could it work? And sometimes it, I mean, it even, I mean, I hate to admit it, but, you know, sometimes it is a matter of putting, you know, hardware on that you don't use, just so at least if you if you're if it's not in the budget to go all the way and get the operable stuff there are ways of having um inoperable ones that at least look like they could work it's not as ideal but you know we we live in a world of gray areas so i'm at a point in my life where where i i want to get i want to balance all of the elements otherwise if we if we get too if we get too sort of off in the ivory tower of saying what it all should be um we're seen as irrelevant. And so it's it becomes a matter of saying, how do we get, how do we balance each of the reality, the realities that we have to get to get closer to what 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 we want it to be. And another question, is everything you cover today in your book? And where can you buy your book? Um, not everything. So all the, the most of the drawings are any of the hand drawings you saw today are in the book, the photographs and a lot of the commentary has been developed since the book. So the case study was not in the book. I developed that afterwards. Um, and so it's a mix, um, but you can buy the book at Amazon or any, any bookseller. Um, and it's, um, but it has a lot of it. It has a lot of the principles. I'd love to actually, I'm hoping to be able to, um, do a, a new version of it to add in some of these layers. I wrote a column for Fine Home Building a little while, um, for a little while, for a couple of years or a year or so, um, that took the, that started off where the book left off, um, getting into some of the more the more detailed elements. Um, so if you, if you remember Fine Home Building or you subscribe to their, um, their website, you can, th those are all archived. Great. And one last question. How did you get the Prince of Wales to write a foreword for your book? Um, well, we were very fortunate. Now, King Charles um, is a strong, strong um, um, supporter of traditional architecture and urbanism and placemaking um, and has been, I mean, he's been a patron. He created Poundbury, which is a traditional neighborhood in um, outside of London, about, in, about two hours outside of London. Um, and he has for, um, well, when it was long before it was even deemed sort of socially appropriate to say, he has talked about how the environment and the, the physical environment, the natural environment, um, the sustain sustainability of place related to the built environment. So he has long time been a champion of this. Um, ben Pentreath, my co-author, uh, worked at the Prince's Foundation. He has um, had, actually don't know the current status of it, um, now that he's no longer Prince of Wales, um, had a um, charitable foundation called the Prince's Foundation, which focused on the built environment. And for at the time that we were writing the book, Ben actually worked there. So he asked him if he would write, write a forward for us. And he very kindly said yes. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, Marianne, so much for giving us this really informative lecture this evening and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And I thank you very much. And I thank everyone for joining us tonight on behalf of the ICA in Philadelphia. And we hope to see you all soon. And thank you and have a great night. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Marianne.